Next, from Chicago, Governor Rauner holds a press conference along with members of the Safe Haven Foundation, an organization that helps ex-prisoners find work, as he signs a bill that gives free birth certificates to released prisoners. This runs about 30 minutes. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Nellie Vasquez Roland, uh, co founder and president of A Safe Haven Foundation. Uh, our organization has been in the business of helping ex offenders since 1994, and we are extremely honored and extremely grateful today to serve as the host site for what we consider an historic event the signing of the uh, Senate Bill 1413. Today I'd like to start out by introducing a story, a success story, of someone that has been uh, engaged in the criminal justice system that can tell you firsthand his experience in terms of A, what happened to him when he came out of the criminal justice system, and how the idea of not having a state ID uh, affected his life and delayed his ability to get back on track, and what happened when he found his way to a safe haven, and how this bill would have actually fast-tracked his uh, ability to get back on track. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to in introduce you all to David, and I'm gonna have him say his last name because I guarantee you I will butcher it. Uh, but again, David, thank you so much for sharing your story. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Economopoulos. I call myself getting uh, paroled from prison. And at that point, um, I got out, I was helpless, homeless, um, couldn't get no identification, everything I had got lost uh, when I was in transition uh, with the police department. I jumped through hoops to get identification, birth certificates, saying who I was, that I even existed. Uh, once I finally got that, I was able to provide uh, identification for myself, get employment, still needed help. I found myself at a safe haven. Um, I've been here since the 6th of December. I came through the program. Uh, did my meetings, sponsors, everything like I was asked to do. At that point, I found myself growing in life, what I should have been doing a long time ago. Um, met Chef Marshall here. I got in the culinary program. Um, I always had culinary experience in my background. Um, my, my mother and father, my father worked for the Department of Agriculture. My mother worked for the city of Chicago. I had Catholic education, Lutheran High School, college graduate. So A Safe Haven gave me structure, direction. So by doing what I was told, demonstrating all the right fields that I needed to be doing, uh, I'm also employed here. Uh, this couple months ago I was asked, and uh, we have a culinary class. I'm an assistant culinary instructor. We do catering. We do great things for the city of Chicago. Uh, people that are homeless, helpless, that I was at one point in my life. So I, everything I have, uh, I own to A Safe Haven and their program. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your help. Thank you, David. Thank you. David's story really represents the lives of thousands and thousands of stories of people that are coming out of the criminal justice system. And as you, as you heard, um, his story really is the face of America. I mean, it's people that come from all walks of life that find themselves in crisis, oftentimes due to the uh, issues of drug and alcohol addiction. We all know that yesterday the president uh, talked about the opiate crisis, and he's being urged right now to consider it a national epidemic. And we would like for everyone here to consider weighing in on that conversation because the vast majority of people that are in the criminal justice system, and that represents probably over 70% of the people that are in the system, are suffering from drug and alcohol issues and we urge everyone to consider the idea of uh, supporting a continuum of care so as people come out of the criminal justice system consider this component this bill that today is being uh, signed right here by Governor Rauner and all of our top elected officials who sponsored and supported this as being a very first step to really transitioning people back to a new way of life in a way that's going to be sustainable so thank you all for allowing me to say those few words uh, without further ado the next person I'd like to introduce you Two is our very own state representative, LaShawn Ford. I have known uh, Representative LaShawn Ford for many, many years, and I know no one else who's really been uh, really leading the charge on this issue in so many levels. And uh, I just want to let you know that it's a tremendous honor to have him here today and to be here introducing him for what, again, is a very historic event. Thank you, Representative LaShawn Ford. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
President um, Nelly and um, Brian. You guys have an outstanding facility and a real program to restore people to a productive life. And I'm always so excited when I drive around the city. I know many of you drive around the city and you see trucks with a safe haven. Now that's really putting people back on track. You know, a lot of nonprofits in the state and across the country say they help people become um, self-sufficient and taxpayers, but a safe haven does it. I always get a great feeling when I come here because it's the real deal. And I'm also very excited to be standing again with Governor Rauner as he makes the decision to sign a very, very important bill. It seems to be a small bill, but it's huge because if anyone knows anyone in their family or friends that spent time in prison, they lose all of their vital records. I mean, the moment that they are incarcerated, their life is turned upside down. The moment that they are arrested, they lose everything, and no one is there to protect their vital records. And so what this bill does, along with the bill that the governor signed a couple of months ago to make sure that people have IDs when they leave prisons, now this bill takes it further to make sure that people have vital records like birth certificates. I don't know of any bill that would help ex-offenders become more reliant on their self than a bill like this because the first thing that a person asks is for your ID. And if you can't get that ID, then you're breaking the law again. And so the governor's um, leadership in criminal justice reform, um, I'll always stand with him on that, and I'm very proud to be a chief co-sponsor of this. And this bill will help many, many people, and it will help a lot of black people in the state of Illinois. And I'm very proud to stand with the governor, and I thank you for um, being a leader in criminal justice reform. I look forward to more signings of bills to help people restore their lives. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Camille Lindsay, and I'm Chief Legal Counsel for the Illinois Department of Corrections here on behalf of John Baldwin, the director. The Department of Corrections and the director believe very strongly that providing men and women with the tools necessary to reacclimate themselves to society decreases their likelihood of reengaging in criminal activity. Making sure that men and women have birth certificates when they go home will assist them in obtaining identification that is essential to them, not only obtaining employment, but locating housing, opening bank accounts, and so much more. Today, we are giving people a real chance to get on their feet when they leave the custody of the department. And for these reasons, the Department of Corrections is proud to sponsor this initiative. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Era Laudermook. I'm the Deputy of Policy and Strategic Planning for the Office of the Cook County Public Defender. I'm here today on behalf of the public defender, Amy Campanelli, and also on behalf of the thousands of clients that our office represents. This bill is a significant step in the right direction of allowing our clients to overcome the collateral consequences that come with being involved in the criminal justice system. This bill helps put a face to the individuals who are seeking to become productive members in their communities. It helps them have an identity. That's a human right issue. This bill is huge because it enables people to be self-sufficient and puts them on a more level playing field to try to improve their lives by seeking employment, having access to housing, access to education, and just being able to be a productive law-abiding member of their community. And for that, we are proud to support this bill, and we'd like to thank Governor Rauner for signing the significant bill into law today. Thank you. The people of Illinois are compassionate. We care about each other. We believe in second chances. We're all human. We all make mistakes. Some mistakes are more serious than other mistakes, but we all make mistakes. Everyone deserves a chance at forgiveness. Everyone deserves a second chance. Everyone deserves to build a good life for themselves and their loved ones. That's what this bill is about. 
I would uh, again like to thank uh, Representative LaShawn Ford and the members in the General Assembly, both Democrats and Republicans, who came together to pass this good legislation. This helps folks who've made a mistake and paid their debt to society come back and lead productive lives. <clears throat> we need to reduce and eliminate every barrier we can to those who paid their debt to society and are trying to reestablish themselves as productive citizens. We need to eliminate as many of those barriers as we possibly can. The tragic fact is many offenders, as they're leaving prison, um, have no financial resources, and many of their most important documents are not accessible. We need to help them get those documents so they can reestablish themselves, apply for jobs, uh, apply for apartments, apply for communications um, uh, contracts with phone companies, et cetera. And identification is essential to that, and a valid certified birth certificate is essential part of that process. This bill that we're signing today, SB 1413, uh, in essence says that our state government now will not charge any fees. It will be completely free for those offenders who are leaving prison and who do not have financial resources to get their birth certificate and other important documents issued to them when they, when they leave corrections, and it'll be for free. They, we, no, none of the normal fees or charges will apply so that the folks who don't have financial resources are not disadvantaged as they seek to make a better life for themselves and their families. This is an important piece of legislation. Again, I want to thank the members of the General Assembly for passing it. It's an honor for me to sign it. And this is just one in many steps we've taken in the last two and a half years since I became governor to dramatically reform our criminal justice system so that it's not only focused on punishment, but it's focused on rehabilitation, uh, mental health treatment, addiction treatment, and focused on helping folks establish themselves and lead productive lives. Job training, education, support, so those who've made a mistake can lead good lives for themselves and their families. This is an important part of making Illinois a wonderful place for all of our residents. And not only will it help establish productive lives, but it'll keep our communities safer. Folks who can lead productive lives aren't forced into a circumstance where they have to choose whether they are going to engage in criminal behavior again or not. They're able to provide for themselves and their families because they can get established and lead good lives. This is about public safety as well as about justice and fairness and social equity. This is an important step and again it's an honor for me to sign this bill. I'd also like to thank Nellie Rowland and her staff here. They do an extraordinary job at Safe Haven helping those folks who need to get reestablished. They may be homeless, they may be without um, income, they may lack certain skills, they may need help with addiction, mental health issues, Safe Haven is there for them, whether it's veterans, especially veterans, I know that's how I first met Nellie 20 years ago, but folks who have made a mistake and are in criminal justice and need to get reestablished. They, they do a wonderful job here at Safe Haven and it's been an honor for my wife and me to be supporters here for pretty close to 20 years. So thank you, with that I'll sign this legislation. Correct. Well, when I got incarcerated, it got mixed up with the police department and then going from the police department to prison. You don't have access to all that information that you had once upon a time before you were a citizen. Stuck in the system, you had no access to your driver's license, any of your personal belongings. So when you get out, whether it's months or years later, where do you go back to get that information that you had once upon a time? And it becomes real hard at that point because you're helpless, hopeless, homeless. You don't, you, you don't exist in the world. No driver's license, no money, no birth certificate. You don't have anything, Social Security card, that you carry on you for everyday identification. How long ago did you start that transition from prison? And what have been the major obstacles? Um, the major obstacles was getting out in society on parole and then even going to get link, you don't have identification, let alone going to get employment to pay taxes, vote, and be a lobbying citizen to society. Did Safe Haven assist you? And how, how long have they been doing that, assisting you in that transition? A Safe Haven has been assisting me since the day I got here, which was December 12th, December 6th, 2016. It's from day one.
They've been nothing but assisting me in every single step that I needed to be in. Employment? Did you em employment. Housing, did you stay here and are you still yes. residing here? Yes, yes. Right now I'm in the transition of getting my own housing within possibly a week or so from now. Do you, do you have former friends who you knew in prison and are, is everybody getting this kind of thing or how do they This is available. How did I get it? I just pretty much walked into it. I inquired about it. Just asked. Just inquired about it, and they told me about an A safe haven, and I'll give it a try. Sat down, kept my mouth closed, my ears open, and I met everybody at A safe haven. The program worked for me, and I've seen a lot of people that it's worked for and it continues to work for. What are the chances you would, uh, you would commit another crime at this point? There's no reason. That'd be insanity. I have my life together. <laughs> I'm, I respect people, they respect me on a personal level, a business level. I have everything I could ask for. I, I can go work anywhere and do anything, but there's no reason for me to go anywhere else when I have everything I want in one place. I mean, I see Miss Nellie walking down the hallway and she's got stacks of papers bigger than hers, and, and she'll stop and, and speak to people whether it's seven in the morning or eight at night. Like she's your best friend, and she does that for everybody that I see, including myself. Do you think we could do this for everybody leaving prison? Or Absolutely. There's no reason to want to. If people want to do it, they're going to do it. You can lead to the holster of water, but you can't make them drink. A safe haven here has culinary, welding, job training, housing. There's nothing they don't have here. It's like Disneyland, greatest place on earth. <laughs> and that's my personal opinion, all due respect. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Uh, you asked a very good question, Jeff. I, if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, just interject here real quick. You asked a very good question about, you know, what is the likelihood of going back to prison if he didn't have these services? Statistically, in the state of Illinois, almost 50% of the people that come out of the jail system, the criminal justice system, the pr state prison system, we're talking about the state prison system, not the county, which is probably even a more frequent flyer situation, about 50% of the people go back into the system within three years. And recently, the county and jail announced that they're giving people naloxone as they're walking out of prison. So that tells you that the vast majority of people are expected to recidivate within two weeks of coming out of the system, and then it'll just be a matter of time before they end up back in prison. The issue of drug and alcohol addiction is a real issue that's costing Medicaid, that's costing the criminal justice system on all levels, from police to you know uh, court systems to uh, jails to the prison system and with one full swoop and one stroke of a pen we are going to immediately uh, see that uh, trend uh, begin the process of reversing like I said this is just the beginning my hope and my aspirations for the governor to be the very first governor in the country to really lead the charge in designing and redesigning not just the delivery system for re-entry but also from prevention and diversion so that people that have these issues have immediate access to services and people like like David, you know, don't ever have to go through this bureaucracy, which really concerns me with the idea that of the question that you asked about how did you lose your ID in the first place? So I'm thinking, oh my God, with all the identity theft that's going on, how do we not have a proper chain of custody of people's IDs? It's just another issue. Think about that one. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions on, on this important topic? Yes, so, Governor, could you buy, uh, and maybe Nellie knows this, what percentage of the people coming out of prison come through either safe haven or something comparable? Is it like 5% is a very small number? And could you, by executive order, Governor, could you somehow come out with a system that was designed for, I don't know, 50% or 100%? In other words, should everybody be eligible for this kind of thing, or are there some we feel couldn't benefit from it? And we know how long it sometimes takes for legislation. So could you just by executive order do this today? Well, that was <laughs> a lot of issues you raised there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so could you by executive order significantly increase the number of people who don't forget about North Korea. You could do what David did. In other words, could you by executive order say you're setting up a system so 25% of the most serious people who could benefit from this could do it because well, so it, it, we want to expand these kinds of services as much as we possibly can. 
And, and as Nellie indicated, we want to try to do it on the front end before people actually have to go into the prison system, help them with addiction, help them with uh, mental health challenges before they, ha they make a, a serious mistake for which they deserve to have to go to prison, which is a tragedy for everyone. Um, but within our criminal justice system, we have been working since, since day one as governor. I've said criminal justice reform is one of the most important things we can do. It increases safety and it makes us more compassionate. It leads to a better life for everyone in Illinois. We are repositioning our facilities. Already two of our facilities, which have been historically just prisons, just keeping people locked away, we've converted them to life reentry facilities where we now have facilities in central Illinois and one in southern Illinois in Murfreesboro that used to be a prison. Now what they are is a not quite so nice uh, version of what Safe Haven does. Their folks get job training, they get life skills, they get their access to their documents, um, they're given educational opportunities, um, addiction treatment, uh, uh, mental health support. So when they're ready to leave, they're ready to maximize their opportunity to lead productive lives. And we're going to try to convert as much of our correction system as we can to rehabilitation and support in increases public safety and, um, and, and drives a better life for everybody. Since you're the governor and since you're in control of the Department of Corrections, it would seem you could do much more on this without legislation by executive order or by simply directing your director of corrections to convert these facilities. You really don't require legislation even though you have it here today, do you? Um, well, it depends on which changes. We are in process of converting other facilities as well to life reentry. We've reduced our juvenile justice um, uh, population, the young offenders, dramatically. And we have, we have moved them into um, local community residences and really focused with them, especially on uh, addiction treatment, on life skills, and on education. So that rather than locking up a teenager, which is so tragic, we're helping them get reestablished in their lives. And we're converting our facilities as best we can. This, I wish. Uh, we could snap our fingers and have it all done immediately. This, the, you know, this this system has been created over the last hundred years. Um, we're changing it as fast as we can. I'm not the most patient person on the planet, but I'm very persistent, and we're going to get this right. We're going to make our criminal justice system truly just and fair, and uh, it, it working better for everybody. On topic. Uh, any others on topic? Okay, so you guys might want to move out of the line of fire. I don't know. <laughs> this is yeah. Thank so you, sir. thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'll say a couple things. The answer is yes, I'm concerned that, that our staff found some errors in what ISBE generated. So that's, anytime you find that, that's a concern. We immediately, we, we, our staff looked at it, found errors, let, let ISBE know that, they, that we thought there was an error. ISBE staff agreed there probably is an error, and they're working to correct that right now. And I'm pushing the, the ISBE, you know, they're, they're their own entity. Um, we, they work at their own pace with their own process, but we're encouraging them to, to, to get the analysis done as fast as possible. Everyone, you and, and your readers and everyone in the state deserves to know uh, the economic dynamic, and we're pushing to get that out as fast as possible. Governor, you said that, Governor, you said that everybody makes mistakes. Have you made any, particularly when it comes to education funding, something that you've championed, during a journal star today in an editorial, really goes through point by point, and they say that you, quote, sabotage the very reform the governor once championed in talking about your mandatory veto. They say that by doing so, you literally sabotage the reform that you once championed when it comes to education funding. So did you make any mistakes when it comes to that or in general, the direction of your office, which people say is going very much to the right? Is that an accurate description? Are you, have you moved right? Uh, well, two, two separate, separate yeah. okay, two, two questions. First, first, um, <laughs> Uh, I ran for governor for two primary goals, to have a booming competitive economy, creating great careers for everyone, everyone in the state, which we haven't been doing for 30 years, and we're making progress. We've added about 120,000 net new jobs. I'm proud of that, but we've got a long way to go. Secondly is to have the best education system in America, and that's cradle to career, and that's early childhood, K-12, to um, community colleges, universities, and vocational training. Um, our education funding system has, has been broken for years. For 20 plus years, we've tried to change our education funding system. Um, before I became governor, 
the General Assembly, the majority that still controls it, cut school funding ten, four times in the prior 10 years. We have used our children as political footballs prior to my becoming governor. And I said no more. More school funding. I demanded more every year, and we're getting more every year. I'm very proud. I'm putting our children and our teachers first. Now, the way the money has been allocated has been broken. We have the biggest gap between low-income districts and high-income. Um, everything that you we. The the answer is no. The answer is no. Simple answer to that is no. Um, we, everything that is in my AV, we advocated during the, the uh, commission process. Um, at the very last minute, what was mostly a good bill, the new education funding formula itself, I support, and that is still in my AV. We're going to lower the gap between low income schools and high income schools, and Chicago is going to get more money and Rockford and Cicero and Maywood and Blue Island and Dalton and Harvey are going to get more money with my AV. This is important. This, this is a social justice fairness issue. Now there are other problems in the bill and I've corrected those with my AV. Um, and I hope they pass my AV and it, it's important that my AV uh, be, uh, that I took the action that I did. But I've, I've said from day one, I'm open if there are other ideas, other compromises, new solutions. And that's why I've encouraged members in both parties to keep negotiating, keep working. If, they've, if there's a, so no some compromise. Handle, though, in terms of not putting out your changes sooner, you said that Republicans, or pardon me, the Democrats, put children as pawns by not unveiling their plan in June. You could have introduced your plan in June, had this all scored instead of still waiting. Well, I, Is that not a mistake? So um, I'll never claim to be a perfect uh, person. Never have been, never will be. I don't know anybody who is perfect. We can all try to do better. But let's be clear, there is no legitimate reason for the General Assembly to have sat on that education bill for two months doing nothing. No excuse. From here, from here, from here, we need to um, try to move quickly. My AV is, what I've changed is now very clear. I hope the General Assembly takes it up and I hope they, they support the changes. We'll see what, how they vote. Yes, yes. One more question today right now. Um, happening right now, um, and they're talking and kind of getting some more public forum information about the effects of your mandatory veto. Do you have any thoughts, any comments for those people meeting right now? Oh, it's great. I mean, the, you know what we need is more truth and more transparency in Illinois. That's a good thing. Um, and I hope they're not just grandstanding or spinning up or using partial information. You know, it's amazing uh, here in our state, we have such great people, but our political system and government system is so broken. And there's all, everybody's just pointing fingers and saying, oh, not responsible. How did we get into the, how did we, for the last 30 years, get the worst education funding system in America? How did we have one of the lowest growing economies in America with massive job losses? We've had a broken system for decades. We're trying to fix it. I'm trying to fix it. It's hard. There's resistance from the folks who like the status quo. I hope that they're honest and thorough in their analysis of my AV. And I hope they're honest and, and, uh, and complete in their discussion about the issues that are broken. And if, and if we're honest and transparent on every element, we're going to come up to a good solution. And whether my AV in and out, as, it, as I propose it stands, or whether there's a compromise or another idea, I'm open. But we should do this quickly and in a, in a way that's fair for our kids. Uh, Thanks very much, everybody. I appreciate it. Governor, one question. <laughs>